And the objective for today's talk will be to examine the utility of echocardiography in the assessment and management of patients with heart failure, which is really an overwhelming talk because I could probably talk about all of the subsets of the characteristics of echo over a long period of time. So I tried to figure out an outline that would allow us to really understand the echo report and how it kind of guides us in how we manage these patients. So I'm going to look at the whys, the wheres, the whats, the whens, the whos, and the hows when it comes to echo and heart failure. So as has been mentioned, heart failure is a collection of signs and symptoms that occur because the cardiovascular system is unable to meet the body's demands. And based on the prevalence and incidence of heart failure, um, it is the most common referral for an echo in our lab to evaluate function given a heart failure presentation. And as with all assessments of patients who present to us in cardiology clinic and primary practice to the lab, histories and physicals will guide what we do. But if we look to the CCS guidelines, echocardiography is first-line imaging, and it's recommended in all patients who have suspected heart failure, and that's to look at structure and function. How do we evaluate? So the thing that everyone will latch onto is the ejection fraction. And your echo reports that you receive for your patients should have a quantified ejection fraction. Um, it should not just say normal. It should not have a huge range. If a range is given and a quantified value is not, it should be explained why. So that's the standard of echo. We use a two-dimensional volumetric calculation. Uh, it's called Simpson's biplane. It looks at tracings of the endocardial border in a four-chamber and a two-chamber. We use geometric assumptions, and we calculate, and we do an end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume divided by end diastolic volume. Normal for men is greater than 52%. For women, 54%. So one of the challenges, and sometimes why you wouldn't get a quantified ejection fraction, is because we can't see the, the border well enough. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And why is the ejection fraction so important? It's what's already been highlighted. This is actually how we classify our patients. So do they have preserved ejection fraction but heart failure? Their EF is greater than or equal to 50%. Are they mid-range, this 41 to 49%? Do they have reduced ejection fraction, less than 40%? So we know that it's important to quantify and give a number because that helps us because it not only decides how we treat them, we have the most data for medical intervention in our patients who have this reduced ejection fraction. But it's not just a one-time measurement because we have patients who have this recovered ejection fraction. Dr. McDonald spoke just briefly about that in that over time with medical therapy, we can see changes in this ejection fraction. So surveillance is important. Um, but that patient population is a unique patient population as they still can have, um, be at risk for adverse clinical events. And I mentioned that we do serial ejection fractions. So it's not just all comers who get that initial ejection fraction, but we will follow. We'll talk a little bit about timing in a moment. But this study that was actually published, Dr. Thavendir Nathan, when he was a fellow who's currently a staff at UHN, uh, looked at how do we best follow ejection fractions? What's the best reproducible technique we have? And it was found that non-contrast 3D ejection fractions were the most reproducible. So you may get an echo report that has a 2D EF or 3D EF. You'll find later in the, uh, in the program, they're going to talk about cardio-oncology. Those are patients that we certainly follow serially, um, and you'll often have 3D ejection fractions, and it's based on uh, data from this study that drives that. Why is 3D better than 2D? Um, it's most helpful because we don't have the same geometric assumptions. We're not dealing with foreshortened left ventricles. Um, which can change in the reproducibility of our study. So 3D, if we can see the ventricle well on imaging, is better than 2D. But we can't always see. 
So the use of ultrasound enhancing agent, which is the new buzzword, because people worry about kidneys when we say the word contrast, even though these do not affect, these bubbles, micro bubbles don't affect the kidneys, but ultrasound enhancing agents are used so we can see the, the left ventricle endocardial borders better. So you may have a, an enhanced image with your quantification of ejection fraction. Now, who here, just by a show of hands, uh, gets echo reports that have strain values? Okay, so not many. Um, this is relevant because it will be brought up in the cardio-oncology talk later today. It's the most common clinical use we have right now, but strain is another measure of LV systolic function. It's a measure of deformation. It doesn't have a unit. We do it with software, and it does what's called speckle tracking. Um, essentially, we use it in some of our diagnoses for pattern recognition, but it's a more sensitive marker of LV systolic dysfunction, meaning you can have an ejection fraction that's still normal, that's not significantly changed, but we can see changes in strain values, and that's indicative of the LV not functioning as well. We can also look at regional variation. Just a quick thought about it. This is, on the top is our 2D images. On the bottom is what's called global longitudinal strain. We d display it in this bullseye pattern. On the far side under panel A, this is a patient who we describe the bullseye pattern as a cherry on top. And this is kind of a regional strain pattern that occurs in patients who have amyloid meaning their, their apex contracts better than the base and mid-ventricle. In panel B, this is a patient who has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. On the 2D image, you can see there's a bit of a septal bulge, and that's where the pale red area is on the strain. It has lower strain values where the, the wall, the muscle thickness is thickest. Panel C is an apical HCM, so all the thickness is at the tip of the heart, and that's why it has a pale area. And panel D has also apical pathology. They've had an apical infarct. So strain is another measure that we'll use in the echo lab in our assessment of patients. Just for you to know, they should be a statement if it's given to you, if it's normal or abnormal. Negative 20% plus or minus 2% is considered normal. So we have ejection fractions, we have strain, we can do it by 3D, we can do it by 2D, but that's not where the report should end. We also need to know LV wall thickness. We can't forget the right ventricle. Is it involved? Is there valve disease? Is the pericardium involved? So I've just got a uh, series of some cases to kind of just show that it's not just the ejection fraction that should drive how we assess and manage these patients. This is a patient whose ejection fraction was preserved. It was in that greater than 50%, but this patient had a heart failure syndrome. You can see on the echo images, there's actually very thick walls. They're asymmetric. The funny motion of the mitral valve is consistent with what's called SAM, or dynamic outflow tract obstruction, and this patient had a diagnosis of obstructive HCM. This is a patient who, on the echo imaging, we not only want the ejection fraction, which fell in the mid-range for this patient, but there was also regional dysfunction in the inferior infralateral wall and basal infral septum, which went with the CAD history that the patient had. This is a patient who was younger, um, in their late 30s, who had, a, on history, revelation of a familial heart failure syndrome. It was a dilated cardiomyopathy. And we can also see that the right ventricle is also not as snappy, not as affected as the left side. And so it's important for us to think about the right side of the heart. And so the report should expand how the RV looks as far as size and systolic function. The blue image um, is a patient who had uh, pulmonary hypertension. They had a dilated right ventricle with systolic dysfunction. The right atrium was huge. The left ventricle is actually hyperdynamic and underfilled, and so we want to make sure that the, that information is communicated to the referring doc who sent them for shortness of breath evaluation. The patient, um, the other echo images is of a different patient who presented with a pericarditic pain syndrome um, and progressive shortness of breath, 
and he actually had a pericardial effusion, but the real pathology was this mass that is seen in the right atrium. It's pretty obvious right here, and that was consistent with a cardiac lymphoma. So that's why he was short of breath. The valves will also play part um, in how these patients can present. This is a patient who actually presented with chest pain and an acute decompensated heart failure. And in this region here, we can see that there actually is an echo dense component of the subvalvular apparatus that comes into the, into the atrium. And the patient actually had a ruptured papillary muscle and acute severe MR that was posteriorly directed. And this was a patient who presented uh, to St. Mike's when I was a resident, um, who came in, his presentation was a little bit more dramatic, it was a stabbing, so he had some chest pain and some shortness of breath, and the echo showed signs of tamponade. So we have fluid up here, we can see that the right side of the heart is being affected in filling, and then this large space down here is a large pleural effusion. So he had many reasons to be short of breath and have chest pain. It was probably the most dramatic presentation of, of uh, symptoms. And the pericardium is often forgotten. Um, if you look at patients who have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, it has to be on our radar. It's one of the things as echocardiographers we look for um, any signs when these patients have been referred for that issue. And if you think about, it's a filling problem when they have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And here it's not because the myocardium can't relax, it's because the pericardium is restricting that filling. And so there are echo-specific criteria we look for to make the diagnosis of constriction. And the biggest thing is it has to be on our radar. This is a bit of a busy slide, but I think that the bottom line, if you look at the box at the bottom, that says that heart failure and a normal ejection fraction, the problem that exists is that they have abnormal myocardial relaxation and they have abnormalities in stiffness. So this cartoon, I think, kind of t says it all. When you have healthy myocardium and it relaxes, it sucks blood into the heart, and that's how it feels. When you have sick myocardium, you actually, it's, the compliance is off, the relaxation is abnormal, you have to push the blood in. And we do that with high filling pressures, which makes people feel short of breath. So when people are seen in the echo lab, we not only have to look at that ejection fraction, whether it's 2D, 3D strain, but we also have to make an assessment on diastolic function. We'll look at things like TR velocity, E primed values, EA ratios, all to say that your report should have a comment on diastolic filling pressures or diastolic grade to help guide what we're doing. So this is the checklist that I think about when I'm generating my report. Do I have a statement on global, regional function? Do I have a diastolic assessment? Have I talked about LV structure, including LV mass? How is the RV, both size and function, what are my valves looking like? Hemodynamic effects of their um, function and a pericardial statement. Now echo it doesn't tell you everything. Um, and sometimes we need to look more closely into history to understand what the mechanism or etiology is. Because if you look at this echo, it could be a tachycardic induced cardiomyopathy, it could be from coronary artery disease. The absence of regionality does not rule out that diagnosis. Again, as Dr. McDonald said, it's the most common cause for a heart failure. Is it a toxic agent? Is it pregnancy-related? Is it a myocarditis, metabolic? Is there nutritional abnormalities? So history and will guide other testing will and other imaging. So CT has a role. Cardiac MRI has a role. Invasive studies like right and left heart cath. So echo is not the stop endpoint, but it is the starting point for our evaluation from an imaging standpoint. When do we do it? Um, new onset heart failure. As I said, it's recommended in all patients. We want to do it ideally within that first two weeks. We also want to do it after we've titrated that goal-directed medical therapy. 
And that's because, as we mentioned, there can be recovery or change in ejection fraction. And that will drive the more advanced therapies that will be talked about. So making those choices will also follow on what that ejection fraction is after we've titrated this. In stable heart failure patients, they recommend one to three years, maybe less frequently if their ejection fraction is in the mid or preserved range, and also if they've had a significant clinical event, if something else is going on. For example, they could have a dilated cardiomyopathy with an ejection fraction of 30%, but now mitral regurgitation has become more of an issue. So we need to do um, surveillance or follow-up echoes with regards to that. Oh, sorry. Um, where do we do it? Now, not all echo labs are created equal. Um, the CCN, or Cardiac Care Network, is going through accreditation processes so that access um, is improved, that we're referring to labs that can give us all this data that we've talked about today. Uh, I think that if you have specific patient populations, um, more centralized um, labs that can produce and have the software and hardware to do things like 3D or strain analysis may be required. Um, but you yourself will be the quality person who's going to determine where you're going to send people for imaging. So I think with, on a case-by-case -case analysis, what that report is show, showing you, what information is being translated, should drive that idea of where do you get that echo. So in kind of conclusion or the take-home point, it's your first line for anyone who you suspect have heart failure. It will help you classify, look into etiology. It may not be the stop point, but it will help you look into it and will help us guide uh, surveillance as well as management decisions. Thank you.